Father, I just thank you for, uh, first of all, for the youth band and for their offering this morning and lifting you up. I thank you for um, the talent that you've put in them, and I pray that they would continue to, to uh, grow that talent as you give them opportunity. And right now, I, I pray for Donnie. I thank you for him, for the wisdom that you've put into him, the work ethic that you've given him to, to search out your word and to learn and to grow. And I pray that you fill his mouth right now with your words, that you would open our ears and our heart to understand what it is he's saying, help him to speak clearly. You're good. You want what's good for him, and you want what is good for us, and I thank you for that. Through your son, Yeshua. Amen. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sukkot. Hog Sameach, right. So a little bit about me real quick before I get into this. For me, I started basically my journey just studying Torah, trying to apply it to my life as a way of just trying to connect with the Father's heart, Right? wanting to have that deeper connection with him because the Torah that he gives us is a Torah of life, it is a Torah of blessing, and it is a way for us to learn more about him and see how he sees us and how we were meant to be. And I felt like when I study Torah, that is what I am looking for. And throughout the course, I have been helping out with some of the Bible studies, the Torah portions on Sabbaths. And it's been a great opportunity for me, not only just to share what I'm learning, to share some of the spiritual things God is working on in my life, but also to share with other people and have their iron sharpen me. So with that said... Today I want to talk about when the party is over. Because right now, the party that we are in is a seven, eight-day festival that is prophetic of the wedding of when our Messiah will come back and marry his bride, which is us. But Messiah has not come back this year. He still has to return. This is another year in exile. And there is, when Sukkot is over, we need to know how we are going to stand and what it means for us. Part of our ability to stand when the party is over is our concept of who God is in our life. Let me repeat that. Part of our ability to stand when the party is over is our ability to understand who God is to us. Many times, we look at the loving side of God, the merciful side of God, the compassionate side of God, and that is a very valid side of God. But there is also a side of God which is just. Many times we say we hear from God, but is that really our flesh speaking? Because we want something met. And really, when God uses the things in our lives that do not feel nice, ultimately that is him showing us in his way that he knows what's best for us and ultimately that he loves us. The second question I want to ask is, and this applies to each and every one of us here today, why are we here? Why are we here for eight days? The fellowship is great. I played basketball a few days ago with my friends. That was awesome. But the focus is Torah. 
The focus is here is we are here because the Torah commanded us for eight days to come and to be joyful in Torah. So that is something to think about. And the third question I would like to ask is, how will the connections we make, be it connections with each other, be it connections with Torah, or be it connections with the Father, how will that carry with us when the party's over? Let me open up in prayer. Abba Father, thank you for this festival. Thank you for the fellowship we have. Thank you for your word, which is never ending, Father, which is infinite in its application to our life, Father. Thank you for your word, which is truth. Thank you, Father, for the living hope you have placed in us in the name of your son, Yeshua, that he died a bloody death so that we could have that living hope and that he is coming back for us, Father. Please soften our hearts, Father, so that we may not just today, but the rest of Sukkot may be open to hearing your words, Father. In your son's name I pray, amen. So, Let's first take a look at the biblical calendar. I don't know if you can see it here, but I'm going to go with this one. I gave a couple of examples. Basically, God works in cycles. The Greco-Roman mindset says everything is linear. We look at 1901 happened, World War II happened in the 1910s, World War I happened in the 1910s, World War II happened in the 1940s, and so on. It's like a linear. That's the Greek Western mindset. You're not Greeks. You're Hebrews. And God looks in cycles. So, if this is June, that is July, that is September, October, this also shows the biblical months, like the 10th month on the civil calendar, the 4th month, the 5th month, the 6th month, the 7th month. This is where we are right now in the month of October, in the seventh month. This represents Yom Teruah, trumpets. That represents Yom Kippur. That's the first day of Sukkot. That's the eighth day of Sukkot in this seventh month. And different throughout the year in the land of Israel, if we are going to look at this from an Israeli perspective, because keeping in mind, we're Hebrews. We're not Greeks. We understand that everything revolves around the agriculture in the land of Israel and the weather seasons and the agricultural seasons. And at this time in Sukkot, we are enjoying the festival. But the rainy season is about to start in the eighth month. The rainy season is also the season where the ground is plowed where they start preparing the soil to be sown. Actually, in the land of Israel, it's kind of interesting because what they do is they sow the seeds first on the hard, rocky soil before the rain comes. Then the rain comes, and then they plow the soil when it's softened. Just an interesting side note. So, let's look at these six months. Currently, right now on the biblical calendar, we're in the seventh month. The sixth month represents a courtship period between the church, between God's children, and God himself. Basically, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, the Israelites in the first century had this mindset that in the sixth month of Elul, the month of repentance leading up to Yom Teruah, it was a month when the king was in the field, when you could go and you could work on yourself with the king, and you could prepare your heart for repentance. Then the seventh month comes along. You have Yom Teruah, you have Yom Kippur. Then you have Sukkot, which is the month where you get married to the king. But then you have this month called the eighth month, Mar Cheshvan, is its like traditional name. And it is the month where you actually take what you learn from Sukkot, the honeymoon period is over, and you're actually moving in with the king. 
So for you and me, that means in the eighth month when Sukkot is over, we're going back to the mundane world. In the Messianic age, that means we are going back to the land of Israel and we will be dwelling with the king in our lives. A key theme of the eighth month is water because keep in mind that that is the month where it is the rainy season. That is when the rains come. They're called the former rains. They're the first rains and that's when they come. It's also important to keep in mind that what you do now in the seventh month will prepare for how you are in the eighth month. Because the eighth month is a month of tilling. It's a month of upheaval. See, we're still in exile, so that means that there's still things that we need to work on. That means even though we confessed our sins and repented of the sins we committed in the seventh and sixth months, we still have those underlying patterns that cause the sin. You see, sin is a symptom of a faulty mindset. Part of tilling the ground is exposing what's underneath. It's about exposing the roots of the dead grass, bringing it to the surface and breaking up the soil. Let me give an example. Many times, something that I've been conscious as, as a young single guy, just preparing myself for one day that I may be married, is that noticing that a lot of us men have a lot of bondage, we have a lot of struggles we have, be it impurity, uh, be it anger, be it shame or whatever, and a, or selfishness is really at the root of it all. And we have these things that we drag into the marriage and we think marriage is the magic bullet for it. But we drag all this garbage into our marriage and we expect the other person to be happy with it and we forget that they're actually our other half. And they're the same person because now we're one flesh. And we look at them as another person, and my sin affects me, but it doesn't really affect them. But in reality, that's a lie. In the same way, in the eighth month, when you go back to the seventh month, you got married to the king of kings at Sukkot. What are you bringing in in the eighth month when you're moving in with your bride, with your groom? You're the bride. What are you moving in with the groom, and what are you bringing in? Because if you bring idols or patterns of idols, and you may say, I'm done with those, but if those patterns are still there and you're bringing that in, don't think that the king of kings will bless you. Don't think that your heavenly husband will bless you and smile at you if you have that in your life, if you have that idol in your life. The eighth month is about an upheaval. To get to a point where you can be used of God, let me take a step back. To get close to God, to get closer to God, requires effort. It requires sacrifice. There's more you have to give up the closer you get to God. The eighth month is about upheaval and taking that out so you can get closer to God. And it's a painful experience. And there's a certain amount of surrendering to that. And sometimes we as believers tend to take discipline. We tend to take the molding process, the potter's molding, as an attack from the enemy when it's really just God working with us. And I was talking with a few young, a few men the other night, and we were talking about to get to that point where you're surrendered to God, it takes being broken. And that's really what the point of the eighth month is. So, the, month, the eighth month is called the month of Marcheshvan. It's the month of plowing. 
literally, the first, if you take the first three Hebrew letters, merach, you get to soften. This is a month where you're softening your heart to the words of Torah. You take rosh, resh, chet, and shin, you get rachash, which means to move and to vibrate. But really, if you look at it in the hephil stem, which is like one of the tenses, it literally means to whisper. It's that point of surrender that I was talking about, to hear the voice of the Father. There's a certain amount of surrendering. You have to be broken enough. You have to be willing to hear his voice. You can't say, God, talk to me, if you don't want to hear what God wants to say. And it's, it's also related, the first Hebrew letters in Mar Cheshvan are a mem and a resh, which make the word mar because it's a bu- bitter, sweet experience. Because it's bitter at first. Another interesting thing to consider is that Mar Cheshvan is also the month the temple was built, the first temple. It was actually not built in that month. It was consecrated in that month, which is kind of interesting on a messianic level because the eighth month is when we finally move into the house with our heavenly spouse. But in this verse, we also see that it is given another name. It is given the name Bul in the month of Bul. And Bul in the Hebrew means produce or outgrowth. And that ultimately the purpose of the eighth month you feel like your world is collapsing and falling apart, it's ultimately so you bear fruit. It's ultimately so the seeds that are sown become plants that produce crops, which produce fruit. It's also related to the Hebrew word bala, which means decay. In order for you to produce fruit for the king, something in you has to die first. That means you have to die to self. There is a certain amount of surrender. It is also called a flood, related to the Hebrew word for flood. I want to look at Genesis 6.17. It says, I'm bringing I'm bringing the flood. And Mabul is related to that Hebrew word bull for a reason. Because it rained 40 days and 40 nights. So, stick in your Bible toolbox a number. And that number is 40. Why? Because 40 represents trial. Because Jesus was tested. Yeshua was tested in the wilderness 40 days. The flood rained 40 days and 40 nights. Torah was given to Moses after he climbed the mountain and was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. It's a trial that happens in your life that bears fruit, and the result of that is a transformation in your life. The idea is that at the end of the 40 days, you're not the same person you were before the 40 days started. So, you may look at this as a bittersweet thing, but to the ancient Israeli, this eighth month was actually a blessing. And we look at Deuteronomy 11, 14, it says, I will grant you land, grant you rain for your land. And it's basically a response to the fact of obedience to Torah. That ultimately that blessing comes after you obey Torah. After you, part of obeying Torah, it's a two-step process. First you hear it. The purpose of Sukkot ultimately is so that we gather here to hear Torah and to rejoice when we hear it. And then the purpose of the eighth month is so you do it, so you do Torah. And it says in response to hearing and doing of Torah, he will grant you rain. He'll grant you this season that seems hard, but really the purpose is so that you can be fruitful. Daniel, he prayed three times a day. What did he pray? We say Daniel prayed three times a day. What did Daniel pray? He prayed what is called the Amidah. It's a list of 18 prayers that correspond. It's what the priests would pray in the temple when they were offering the daily offerings. And one of those prayers is a prayer of agricultural blessing. And it's kind of interesting because during the summer, um, 
the format didn't turn out right, but that's okay. It's, they would say, V'tem bracha alpanecha adama. Grant blessing on the face of the ground. That's what they say during the summer. But starting on the eighth day of Sukkot, they say, V'ten, V'ten tal umata livrachacha adama. Basically means bring the rain. On the eighth day, you're praying for the blessing of the rain. You know what's coming in the eighth month, but you're praying it for it anyway. Because you understand that water and Torah are related. Because when you, just, when you pray for rain, you're not just praying for rain. You're praying for Torah, which is the word of God. Isaiah 55 verse 1 says, Hoy kol tsema lamayim. All who are thirsty come for water. And then Deuteronomy 32 verse 2 says, V'ya'arof kamatar lechi. May my discourse come down as rain. It's literally talking that the words of God themselves are like the rain and the water. So there's this connection between water and Torah that really when you go into the eighth month on an agricultural physical level, you're praying for your physical material needs to be met. But on a spiritual level, you're praying that your heart might be more open to Torah. I'm going to sidetrack. This was not a part of the plan. There's a verse in Psalm 119 which says, Gal Anai, open my eyes to Torah. And literally, when you look at Jacob, when he rolled the stone off the well, it uses that same root, Vayagal. He rolled the stone off the well. Ayin, my eyes, open Gal Anai, that's the verse in Psalm 119. And I is also a word for a well represents water. Open my eyes to receive the well from the well of Torah, the water. Sukkot is all about water. Think about it for a second. Sukkot is all about water. It's all about Torah and it's all about water because to the Hebrew, that's all they were thinking about. Everything they did during this festival was connected to water. It was connected to Torah and water because you understand that just as a fish needs water, so you as a human being, without Torah, without the word of God, you can't live. It's, and it's also a month where they consider that the world is judged by water. This is a Jewish tradition, but it's actually very biblical because you go to Zechariah 14 verse 16 and it basically says, that all the nations are required to go up to the land in the Messianic age for the festival of Sukkot. They're required to go up to Jerusalem to worship, and if they don't go, God won't give them rain for their land. And this is where the Talmud and the Mishnah say the judgment, God's judgment of whether or not to give rain is passed on Yom, um, Sukkot. So let's talk about the elements of Sukkot related to water. The first element is the Sukkah itself. And I'm going to challenge the way you guys think about Sukkah, the Sukkah. And a Sukkah is really not what you think it is. We're going to talk about the citron, which is one of the four species. And... I could talk about all four species, but for lack of time, we're just going to talk about the citron. And then I want to talk about the daily Sukkot offerings, and really ultimately how these prepare us for the eighth month, and how they're connected to water, and the outpouring of Torah, and ultimately the outpouring of the Spirit in our lives. So the Sukkah. Rule number one about the Sukkah, it is not a tent. Rule number two. I've broken this one. It is not an RV camper. (laughs) It says in Leviticus 23, verse 42, you shall live in booths for seven days. Because I made the children of Israel live in Sukkot. 
And to the Israelite, they lived in tents. That was a different world, a word. We'll get there in a minute. And they lived in, in the 40 years of wandering, they lived in tents as they went around in that circle. But really, they did not look at their tents as a sukkah. They looked at the cloud of glory, the protection of God that was over them as that sukkah. Just a little something to consider. If we follow the rule of first mention, so generally if you are reading your Bible and you come across a concept, a word, or just a general idea that you notice a passage explains, the way to dig deeper into that is to, find, is to follow the rule of first mention. Where's that verse first brought up? Where's that concept? Where's that word? Where's that idea first brought up in the Bible? And you go back there. And doing that, we're going to go back to Genesis 33, verse 17 for the word sukkah. It says, Jacob journeyed to Sukkot and built a house for himself. Vayevan lo bait. That is important. He builds a house for himself, a structure. And what does he do? Umik nehu, umik nehu asasukot. He makes for his cattle stalls. So basically the house is for him and the stalls are for the animals. The suko are for the animals. Sukkah is what we're commanded to make in Leviticus 23. That's what we're celebrating right now. It is not a tent because the Hebrew word for tent is ohel. A sukkot is up there. That's a samak, a kaf, a vav, and a tav. An ohel is an aleph, a he, and a lamed. It's a different word. The idea is a sukkah was not meant to keep out the elements. A tent is meant to be waterproof so that you're, when you're in it, it can rain, but you don't get wet. If it's hot outside and the sun's beating down you, you can go inside this tent and you won't, and you get shade. A sukkah is different. And if you look at the way the ancient Israelis can, did and the way they continue to do, is the sukkah is built in such a way that it has to let in the light. It has to let in the water. And the idea is your sukkah, if you were a first century or even before then an Israelite living in the land of Israel, you had to build your sukkah in such a way that rainwater, if it rained, it had to get in. If there was sunlight, it had to get in. If you understand that light represents the revelation of Torah, and if you understand that water represents Torah itself, that means that you as a human being, which is represented by the sukkah, you have to be, re- you have to be receptive to Torah. You, Torah doesn't just hit you and slide off and then lands at your feet and then drains into the ground. That's not what Torah is for. It's meant to seep in. It's meant to reach your core so that it changes you from the inside out. And that's why a sukkah is built that way. It's built like an animal stall so that you are exposed to the elements when you are in it. I want to talk about the citron, the etrog. It says, take the product of the chadar, the etz chadar, pre etz chadar. And literally in the Hebrew, this means the fruit of the beautiful tree. So if we, as Western Gentiles, we're not Western Gentiles, we're Israelites. But if we were to say for a minute that we are Western Gentiles, we don't know what a fruit of a beautiful tree is. It could be the olive, it could be a fig tree, it could be a pomegranate, it could be an apple. It could even be a lemon, but it's not. Because if you understand the culture of the ancient Israelite culture, there are things, like for instance, let me give an example. I say a soda pop. You all know what it is. You know, I'm probably talking about a Dr. Pepper, a Coke, or a Coca-Cola when I say soda. In that culture, when you said a pliatadar, they understood that that meant the etrog. 
And you can actually look at the Roman coins that they made when they destroyed Jerusalem. This is, I'm just going to see if this is. There we go. And you can look at these Roman coins when they destroyed Jerusalem, and you can see even the ancient Israelites understood that the citron, the etrog, was that fruit. So, let's talk about the citron. It requires constant irrigation for growth. It has a long growing season. Basically, it takes all year for fruit to appear on the tree. It requires well-drained soil. It is one of the true primary species, meaning that our lemons, our oranges, and all other citrus fruits stem from primary fruit, uh, citrus species. Like, our, when you go to the store and you pick up an orange, a lemon, or a lime, or a grapefruit, or even a nectarine, not a nectarine, but you pick a citrus fruit out, that's a hybrid. It's a genetically modified fruit. The citron's the real deal. It's the original. Another interesting thing is to notice is it's difficult to prune around the sharp thorns. As a plant, it can't really resist diseases in today's modern world um, without being grafted into another tree. You have to graft it into another tree to make it resistant to diseases. It also has a beautiful smell, meaning it smells beautiful, and it also has a lovely taste. So, the constant irrigation for growth, what does that refer to? That means you're constantly immersed in Torah. That means if you are the etrog tree, because the Bible says a man is like a tree, you are constantly immersed in Torah. The way you survive as a human being is you're constantly soaking it in. It takes a long time because it's a long growing season, but you also know you're in this journey for the long haul. It will take a long time for you to bear fruit, but you just keep plugging along. It requires well-drained soil. That means that basically you don't like stagnant water. That means you don't sit on the same Torah concepts. You take what you learn and you apply it. Also, you don't stay on the milk of the word. You move on to the meat. You're constantly searching. You're constantly hungry. It's living water. It, it's mayim chayim. It's moving water that's moving in your life and creating change. It is one of the true primary species, which means it hasn't been mixed with the world. It's been able to maintain its identity. You have been able to maintain your identity, and you will only be able to maintain your identity as a Torah observant follower of Yeshua if you don't mix with the world. It is difficult to prune. What does that mean? That means when the eighth month comes along and you have to prune away the dead branches that are sucking the life out of the tree. There are thorns in your life that are just going to hurt. And you have to just bite the bullet and you have to just take the pain and trust that the Father is going to carry you through. And it's a surrender process. What does it mean that it, you have to be grafted in? It means that we need each other. It means that we need the Father, that we can't fight our battles against the flesh. We can't follow Torah in our own strength. You see, the Jewish people... I am not against the traditions of the Jewish people. But I do think it is interesting that when a person does not have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit dwelling inside them, when the Holy Spirit's not given, they have to create a fence and create thousands of rules in addition to the 613 rules. That said, those, those thousands of rules do have value, but... The Holy Spirit in your life being grafted into the source helps you overcome. It has a beautiful smell, which means your lifestyle is reputable. Your lifestyle aligns 
with what you know. It is not enough to know Torah. You have to apply it to your life. And the purpose of Sukkot, taking that fruit, is to show you that you need to apply it to your life. First of all, you need to come to the Deuteronomy readings or whatever teachings are going on and try to glean as much Torah as you can. Then when Sukkot is over, you go home and you try to apply it. You say, now it's time to walk it. I want to move on to the daily Sukkot offerings. Because when we first come into this walk, the tendency is to go directly to Leviticus 23. I got the four species, I built the sukkah, and I take off the first day, and I take off the eighth day, and we have a blast. But if you go to Numbers 29, it also talks about the temple side. You see, Leviticus 23 is just for the Hebrew. The norm, there are three levels of Israelites. There's the priest, there's the Levite, and then there's the average Israelite. Numbers 29 talks about the priests. And us being a kingdom of priests, Numbers 29 is important. It says on the 15th day of the month, you'll observe a sacred occasion. And then Numbers 29, I will not read this, goes on to talk about that for the first day, you present 13 bulls. The second day, that will be 12 bulls. And by the end of the feast, you will have offered 70 bulls for the nations, 98 lambs for, to like counteract the 98 curses that are in Deuteronomy 28. And the purpose of this ultimately is to get you familiar with the sacrifice system, the temple system. Because if you are a first century Israelite, you're not a Greek anymore, your life revolves around the temple. So, to give some backstory, on a daily basis, when the temple was functioning in the land of Israel, they offered one lamb in the morning, and in the afternoon they offered another lamb. In addition, on Sukkot, they would offer the numbers of bulls and extra lambs in addition to that. So there was a morning service and an afternoon service. This service required water. Water had to be brought to the temple. And this is where we get the water libation ceremony. If you go to the Talmud, Sukkah 51 verse 8, basically the Talmud provides the historical perspective. These were the men who lived in the temple days, and they put together this. They said, he that has not seen the joy of the ceremony of drawing water in his life has not seen joy. What is he talking about? So, if you remember, the morning offering, you needed water for that, to bring water to the temple, just for the general process of offering a lamb. The night before, the people would gather in the they would gather here in the court of the women. This is where, this is the outer courtyard. That is the holy place. That is the holy of holies. They would gather here in the court of women. That it means they would gather where men, women, and the children were allowed to be together and congregate. And they would celebrate. As the priests would leave, they'd go down here to the pool of Siloam, and they would draw water for the next day. And the people took this simple command of just offering the lambs and the bulls, and they turned it into a celebration. Why? Because Torah is a delight. You, it's not just a necessity. It's a way of life, and it is a delight. It is life. And that is what they did. And it says, joyfully you shall draw water from the fountains of salvation because they knew it represented something deeper. And actually, this is something that was mentioned in Jesus' time, in Yeshua's time. He brings this up in John 7, verse 39. He says, on the last and greatest day of the festival... Yeshua stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. 
By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who have believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. The point is, there's a connection here. Yeshua is making. He's saying, you're taking this celebration, which is about Torah, but also you need to receive the Spirit. Because the Spirit takes this Torah and makes it living. You remember the, the citron tree? It needs living water. It needs moving water. Mayim Chaim, moving water. That's the spirit. It brings life to the Torah. It says, For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from the countries and bring you back. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your impurities, from all your idols. This is talking about the, talking about the future messianic age, but we can also look at the principles and apply it to the eighth month and see how He's purifying them. I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will remove from you your heart of stone that is, and give you a heart of flesh. So he's going to soften the heart of stone and replace it with the heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Notice the spirit comes in and helps you follow the Torah after your heart has been tilled after your hard heart has been softened. It's ultimately a thing of past and future. Understand where you have come from and where you are going. And that ultimately, where we came from before the season of Teshuva was a state where we needed in Yom Kippur and Yom Teruah, make ourselves right before God. It was supposed to be a season to break those strongholds in our lives and break the sin, like break the curse of sin in our lives. And where we're going is the land of God to dwell with the king. It says, according to the doings of the land of Egypt, where you dwelt, you shall not do. So where you came from before Sukkot, before you dwelt in Sukkot, before the children of Israel dwelt in Sukkot, it says, do not do like Egypt did. And where I am bringing you, that is the land of Canaan, you shall not do, nor you shall walk in your, their ordinances. You shall observe my judgments and keep my Torah, keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my statutes and my judgments. If a man does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. It's all about building the right house. See, right now, we're in Sukkot. We're living in a temporary dwelling. We're doing that because right now what we're doing by hearing Torah is we are building a foundation. We're building a house upon that foundation so that when Sukkot is over, we're moving into that house. I'm going to keep drilling this in until you guys get it. I'm going to keep drilling it in until I get it too because you guys, me telling you guys is helping me. It says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them I will liken them to a wise man. This is Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended. That is the eighth month. The floods came and the wind blew and beat on the house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But anyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and it was great. Its fall was great. Right now, this is Sukkot. This is a time for you to hear Torah. This is a time for me to hear Torah. This is a time for every one of us to hear Torah. But hearing Shema Yisrael, that hearing implies action. And how we will act determines whether or not we will fall or stand, because when the eighth month comes and the winds and the rains come and your foundation is shaken, you can either blame God and get angry at him. You can try to scheme your way out of it and pout. And it is okay to feel sad when your life has fallen apart. 
It is okay to sit and feel the depression when your world is shaking. It's okay. It is okay to be brought low. Because then in that state, you understand that you are helpless. And that the only way to stand is if someone's propping you up. And you turn to the king. And he's the rock. Because if you are by yourself, it is just sand. But if you cleave to the rock, that's him. And you do this by applying what Sukkot teaches us, which is that you need the Spirit. The Torah, according to Galatians 3, by the way, guys, I'm going to do, before I read these verses, I want to take a quick step back. A lot of times the Christian church likes to take Galatians and spin it to mean you don't have to follow Torah. I kind of want to show you how, actually Galatians is talking about you can't follow Torah if you have the wrong mindset. But really, if you have the right mindset and you have a spirit-filled approach, you will be able to follow Torah principles in your life. Therefore, the the Torah was our tutor to bring us to Yeshua, to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith, we are no longer under a tutor. For you all are children of God by faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. For as many of you have been baptized into Messiah, you have put on Messiah. It says the letter of the law was there to show you how helpless you were. Because part of the seventh month is realizing when you read the words of Torah, I don't add up. That's the biggest thing. It's a funny feeling when you try to follow Torah to the letter. And you want your life to be an offering. And you realize that you still don't add up. That your offering's there and it still still doesn't add up. And the purpose is, the Torah, is to show us that you don't add up. So when you think, I don't add up, you're supposed to think that. Because you're not strong enough to do it on your own. It's a tutor that way, so that you turn to Yeshua HaMashiach, and you're baptized in Him, and you put on Him. But how do you baptize? What does that baptism look like? John 3, 5. I say to you, unless you are born of water and of spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. The born of spirit means you recognize that you are a sinner, that you've fallen from the grace of God, and you turn back to Him. And you are baptized. You are baptized in a pool of water. We do this all the time. The baptism in the Spirit means the Spirit comes inside you and helps you become a better person. It helps you follow His Torah. It makes you more like Messiah. This Spirit that comes in us helps us bear kingdom fruit. And I won't quote this verse, but you can see that there are fruits of the Spirit And there are fruits of the flesh. Because when you try to follow the Torah with just the strength of your flesh, all you're going to do is bear flesh fruit. Paul writes about dead works of Torah. What he's talking about is the works of sin. But really what sin is, there are different levels of sin. But one of the layers of sin is missing the mark, meaning you try your hardest to follow Torah, but you're still missing the mark. And it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against which there is no law. And that law isn't the law of man, it's the law of God. There is no such Torah command against these fruits of the Spirit. That once you have a Spirit-filled life, you are in line with Torah. So why is it important Ultimately, because Sukkot serves as a preparation for the eighth month. So you know that when the world, your world, is shaking, that's okay. You have the right rock to stand on. But that eighth month is also a preparation in and of itself. 
The eighth month is there to teach you that you can't stand on your own and that you need to rely on the king. And you need to know Torah. What does it mean? What's the difference between hearing and knowing? Because when you hear and you do, that becomes knowing. You know it in your hands because you've been, it becomes, we call it muscle memory. The idea is that Torah becomes so living in our lives, we know it because we're doing it. And we take that knowledge and it helps us. How does it help us? How does it help us? Because we are living in the last days. We're living in the last days. The king still hasn't come yet. Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, the trumpets blew. Messiah did not come. So, we're still in exile. There's still an awakening occurring. And part of that awakening means that more and more people are coming. But the danger of that is that we are warned according to the Bible that in the last days there will be false prophets who will rise up in our midst. And the purpose of the eighth month is to make you know Torah so well that when the false prophets come, you will be able to spot them for what they are. You see, a true prophet of God should draw you to Torah. It should show you that you've fallen from Torah, that you are unable to keep Torah. It should point you to the grace of God and it should show you how to receive that grace and how through the help of the Spirit to make the Torah that you were once not able to fulfill with, not able to follow become a part of who you are, become an essence of your being. A prophet who is false will tickle your ears. And this is something for each and every one of us to know. So that we, as the bride of Messiah, will be spotless when he comes. In the Torah portions a few weeks back, it was kind of interesting because it was talking about do not follow idols. Do not file, follow idol worship. And it was basically talking about how you should have a violent attitude against idolatry. And for us as in this day and age, idolatry could be anything. It could be from the movies we watch to whatever in our lives takes the place of God. And someone who appeals to that is dangerous because it says that right, that person rises up in our midst and we, if they're claiming to speak the words of God, we have to be quick to shut that down and say, no, I know the Torah. I was at Sukkot and I read it and that sparked a change in my life. And in the eighth month, I learned how to apply it to my life. So my question I want to leave you with today is, where will you be when the party is over? Thank you.